Hi, this is Reuben Leader, and I'll be reading an excerpt from my novel, You Might Feel a Little Prick. This passage focuses on the character of Julie, Dr. Julie Toffoli. When we first meet her, she's a first-year intern at Cleveland Mercy Hospital. Her dream of helping people by becoming a doctor had its origins when she was a little girl with a very sick mother. At four years old, Julie couldn't do much for her mom, but she knew exactly what she wanted to be when she grew up. To use a shop-worn phrase, Julie is not afraid to speak truth to power, yet she is compassionate, obsessive in her quest to do the best for her patients. She exemplifies the nobility of the medical profession. So, why in this passage, pretty far into the book, is she in a police station, handcuffed to her childhood sweetheart, Nick Glass, former minor league ball player and present-day back surgery patient, facing multiple murder charges? You'll have to read the book to learn all that. But this bit I'm about to read will give you some insight as to how Julie feels about their situation, as well as how she feels about the police detective who put them in this cell. Nick and Julie were once again cuffed, but this time to each other, an attachment as inevitable as breathing. But for how long, Julie wondered. They were alone on one of the backless benches in a barren holding tank, a dank, empty room which smelled of stale sweat and bad choices. Julie couldn't help but think about how they got there. Once upon a time, she and Nick had been like everyone else who bought into the mythology that if you believed, that if you worked hard enough, your dreams and aspirations would come true. But now, their dreams were no longer theirs, snatched away by a capricious universe, a cosmic jokester they never saw coming. She tried to move her cuffed hands a bit, but realized Nick had fallen asleep against her shoulder. One of those rare, fickle moments when the invisible weights on his eyelids forced them closed and his body gave way to its need for regeneration, as fitful and brief as the moment might be. So Julie kept her cuffed and sore hands still, ignored the chafing pain as she rebuked her gone road mind for wondering what might have, no, what should have been which inevitably led to her wondering where and how the rest of their lives would play out from here. From this bench, no place good. Separate cells and separate prisons, in separate but similar states. States of despair and disillusion, to be self-pitying about it. Well, screw it. Cue the violins. How else was she supposed to feel? The answer was it didn't matter, because life as planned was over for them obligatory as the final shot of a doomed couple in some old black and white French film noir, flawlessly framed heartbreak, their punishment for having the vanity to dream. From another room, behind a closed door, voices indistinctly murmured, phones jarringly rang. No ringtones here, just old school strident bells that wouldn't have been out of place in a good old police or American the American noir, where Sikorsky would have been played by fellow Clevelander Brian Donlevy. No discussion of American film noir would be complete without mentioning tough guy actor Brian Donlevy, who often played hard-nosed cops, sometimes with a faintly discernible heart. Well, Sikorsky wasn't Brian Donlevy. Sikorsky was a poser, a third-rate throwback, with about a third of the brains of the blacklisted Hollywood screenwriters who pseudonymously laid bare their despair on the blank page. And despair was never a good beginning, just an inescapable end. The door opened. Mm -hmm.